Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us here on Urban Debate on Mirror Now. I'm Hina Gambhir. Setting the tone for Budget 2022-23, the Economic Survey today was tabled by Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman in Parliament. This was the new Chief Economic Advisor Nageswaran's first economic survey who took charge last Friday. The survey, however, was prepared by a team led by Principal Economic Advisor Sanjeev Sanyal. And Economic Survey viewers, a day ahead of the Budget presentation is like a report card of the economy. And tonight, we want to focus on four key issues from the eco-survey. GDP, jobs, fiscal deficit, and meeting the 5 trillion goal by 2024-25. Now, appreciating government's response to the pandemic, the survey points to economic activity recovering to pre-pandemic level. GDP growth for current year is seen at 9.2%. As for the principal economic advisor, the overall GDP is 1.3% above the pre-pandemic level. While for 2022-23, the government is expecting 8 to 8.5% 8 growth rate. Now, pandemic also brought job losses and the economic survey looked into the issue of unemployment employment as well. The principal economic advisor said there is dearth of good official unemployment data which is real time. What we do know from the official detailed survey is that there was a significant decline in employment during the rigid lockdown and then a very significant revival up to about March. So that was about the issue of unemployment in the eco survey. Third issue was about fiscal deficit. So fiscal deficit basically is the difference between total revenue and total expenditure of the government. The target for this year that was set during the budget presentation last year was 6.8%. Now, as per Eco Survey, this looks quite comfortable. In fact, there are also indications of room for more government expenditure. Lastly, the Eco Survey also gave some idea on how India can achieve its goal a $5 trillion economy by 2024-25. In fact, it says that it needs to spend about $1.4 trillion on infrastructure to be able to meet these target for the remaining number of years. So let's now go across to our guests who are joining us this evening and try to decode the eco-survey for you and going by what was mentioned in this report card of the economy today. What is it that we can expect uh, during the budget presentation tomorrow by finance? Minister Nirmala Sitaraman. Joining us this evening is Gurcharan Das, an economist and former CEO of PNG India, best-selling author. We are also joined by Ajay Baga, who is a senior market expert. Joining us uh, this evening is also Dr. Brinda Jagirdar, who is independent director and senior business economist and former chief economist SPI. Professor Santosh Mehrotra, economist, visiting professor at University of Bath, UK, also with us on the broadcast this evening. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining us here on Urban Debate this evening. Mr. Gurcharan Das, I want to begin the discussion with you. Now, let's uh, first talk about the issue of economic growth and the commentary that came that, you know, we have in fact uh, moved to the pre-pandemic level already and India will continue to be the fastest growing economy in the world, not just this year, but even next year as well. Your comments and your takeaway on the growth aspect, sir. Well, I think the the eight to eight and a half percent target for the coming year is achievable if we do the right things. And the right things were the ones that the finance minister promised in the last budget. In fact, the last budget was an excellent one with a huge thrust for infrastructure spending. The, I, the, M, the pipeline, the monetization pipeline was a terrific idea. Um, the, it was a transparent budget. And I think if we continue along those lines, push harder uh, the MSME, uh, you know, the banks are not loaning money to MSMEs. Something has to be done about that. I'd like <laughs> uh, Brinda here to tell us a little bit more about why they're not lending enough money. But, and the nice thing about this year has been the remarkable uh, exports uh, bouncing. You know, we were hovering around 300 billion 
And now this year, it looks like we are close to 400 billion. So that, I think, finally, we may have uh, cracked it. Um, but ultimately, I, I think what is, let me I'll complete the but though, that it depends, the it, eight and eight and a half percent depends on um, an external environment whereby the, there's an orderly easing of liquidity by the central banks, uh, because this is they, they need to control their inflation, and then and that's very important. And that there is another, not another wave, a pandemic wave, that's also very important. And the oil price should be between 70, 75, not much more. There should be a normal monsoon. All these are factors. But really, to me, the most important thing. The most important thing is growth. Why? Why growth? Because jobs. We, let's admit it, and it's not just this government, but we in our country have failed to create jobs. When Mr. Modi talked about Achedin, that's what he meant. And it wasn't just Pakorewala jobs. It was real jobs. And that actually, the number of jobs we have today, if you go by both the CMIE data as well as the government's own data on, on jobs, we have the same number of jobs as we had in 2015. And six, seven years later, uh, so many lakhs of people have entered. But let me give you a bigger perspective. The longer perspective is the fact that it, the, it's not just the unemployment rate we should look at. We should look at uh, the labor participation rate. In other words, if there are 100 people who should be in the labor market, in India, only around 40%, CMI says 38, government sources say 42, but say 40. Whereas we are the lowest in the world. And if we were equal to what the other countries are, around 55 to 60 percent, we are talking about 200 million jobs that we have failed to create. And, so, to, and, and that's 20 crores. And frankly, the, um, the, this 20 crores, <laughs> I mean, it's, it is staggering. And the women, especially in India, have the almost the lowest rate of jobs for women. So the purpose of growth, everything, and therefore labor-intensive growth is what we need. We need the MSMEs employ a lot of labor. Construction uses a lot of labor. Uh, housing is a very labor intensive sector. So I, I think our criterion in India should be uh, the labor intensity. This is where we failed and the Far East countries who created an industrial revolution, the tigers, latest China, they created jobs through the export yes. of labor intensive products. And that would be the way to go to your five trillion <laughs> target. Well, I think, Mr. Gurcharan Das, you hit the nail on the head because on one hand, while the numbers are trying to suggest that, you know, we are, uh, you know, on this path of economic recovery, but there are two very, very crucial issues that need to be addressed. One, clearly, as you currently correctly mentioned that, you know, we as a country have failed to create jobs. That's one thing that needs to be addressed. And second, we need labor intensive growth. Uh, Dr. Brinda, how uh, will you like to react to, you know, how the economic survey uh, today spoke about the issue of jobs specifically. Even after so many years, it seems that we do not really have any credible data to tell us what is happening in the organized sector, what is happening in the unorganized sector vis-a-vis -vis jobs. You're absolutely right. We don't have a clear picture of the jobs that are being created in the economy. If we are setting up new plants, if infrastructure is expanding in such a large pace, 
then clearly some jobs are being created and perhaps they are not being captured. Now, I feel, uh, remember there was a time when we were talking about the IIP data and uh, the IIP data was just not uh, showing any change while the economy was uh, showing a lot of uh, traction. So it was found that they are in the data that they're capturing, they were including goods like typewriters. When typewriters are no longer being made in the economy, and uh, the, in the country, and there were, you know, instead set top boxes and things like that were being uh, produced, but were not being captured in the data. So I think it's time now we have uh, a relook, a serious look at the way we capture the data. Uh, so, uh, I mean, NSSO and uh, CMI, et cetera, they're doing their bit, but I think we need a bigger picture into where the jobs are and how they are being created, because there are a lot of new things which are coming, like for example, in the gaming area. That's very, very, uh, you know, it's growing in a very big way. Now, I don't know how much of labor it employs, but certainly it does employ labor. And India is poised to be, you know, one of the fastest growing video markets in the country, OTT, video. So how much of uh, employment is coming from there? Because I know people have quit jobs, quit uh, corporate jobs, and they have become bloggers because they're able to earn a good income from there. So I don't know how this is being captured in the employment uh, data because self-employment must also be included. Um, so having said that, uh, the labor participation rate, which uh, Mr. Gurcharan Das mentioned, it's really very important, but you know, women are not uh, being, uh, you know, not being uh, attracted to the labor market a lot because they have uh, child support is an issue. So uh, we need to look at uh, that area also. And another area is uh, education and skilling. So unless we have this, the right kind, because they say jobs are available, engineers are there, but they're not employable. So the employability issue will be tackled when we have education and skilling in place. So uh, there's no doubt that the next set of uh, growth, the growth will have to come from MSMEs, self-employment, and the smaller um, uh, companies, because they occupy, say, 40% of exports. And by the way, yes, Exports have grown and exports have, uh, uh, they're mainly in the unemployed, I mean, sorry, in the self-employed and small-scale sector. Now, why have exports grown even though they are MSME, MSMEs and export sector have grown? Because they have been able to make, take advantage of the, uh, the, the schemes offered by the government and the digitization which has taken place. So clearly there's a divide between MSMEs which are digitally savvy and those which are dependent on traditional methods. So perhaps we need to also encourage this little bit of handholding may be required to make sure that they are able to uh, come onto the digitized platform and expand their growth. So we need not only capex in the bigger industries because they have multiplier effects, but we also need it in the MSME sector and the self-employment right. sector because more than you know, a, a, a huge chunk of employment comes from this sector. Yes, absolutely. Professor Santosh Mehrotra, in your opinion, uh, what is it that you will like to take away, uh, in fact, uh, on the issue of jobs from the eco-survey, from the uh, growth uh, projections that have come for this year and next year? Do you think India will be able to meet these targets? I'm afraid not. You know, an 8.5% GDP growth means that you have to have investment at a rate of something like 38% of GDP. Because there's some, something which is called the incremental capital output ratio. How much GDP is generated by, a, by one unit of investment. And on average, you measure that on a rolling basis for five years. And the, the last five years, the ICOR, the incremental capital output ratio, is around, around five, which means that in order to grow at 8% plus, your investment to GDP ratio has to be 40%. And what is the 2021 or 21-22 investment rate? It is below 30%. It's 29.4, in fact, in the first okay. advanced estimate. So... We are 10 percentage points or more below what's required to achieve 8.5%. So let's, let's forget about 8.5. We might be able to achieve six or six and a half. And if we do, we should count ourselves lucky. Second, okay. on jobs you asked me, on jobs. 
you know, I'm I'm a bit fed up of listening to this uh, uh, song about how poor the quality of our employment data is. We have government data produced by the National Sample Survey Organization based on a representative sample across the whole country every year for the last three to four years. Secondly, we have an equally credible private source of data, CMI, which gets generated every month. So please don't tell me that this is not capturing organized sector. Sir, it's this not time it's not me who's saying it, organized. Professor Mehrotra. You know, this time it's not me who's saying it. I know I've said this to you earlier also, but this is what is mentioned in the Eco Survey today. Uh, the this is what the uh, principal economic advisor, in fact, had to say. Respect. There is dearth of good. There is dearth of good official unemployment data. I'm not saying it, sir. Rubbish. Document itself Rubbish. believes that you know we Rubbish. do not have the right data Rubbish. in front of us. Rubbish. Rubbish. I can't repeat this more often. The economic survey is showing illiteracy by debunking the government's own Ministry of Statistics National Sample Survey Organization's data, which is showing in no uncertain terms that unemployment has not fallen. Between 17, 18, and 19, 20, <laughs> by the current weekly status, which is the international standard, and the and the and the NSO estimates that the unemployment rate did not fall. And as Mr. Kurcharandas rightly pointed out, no, it says we have among employment the fell. Employment rate fell during the rigid lockdown, That's what I'm and then to. very significant revival up to that. about March was chance. witnessed. I know that Gurcharandas said it. I'm I'm emphasizing that that the, uh, the employment rate is falling and the unemployment rate is rising simultaneously. This is tragic. This is tragic at a time hmm. when the share of the working age population is rising every year. Please remember that before COVID began, we already had 30 million pe people unemployed. We are now adding at least four to five million right. young people into the labor force every year. In addition, we have to provide jobs, not just to these four and a, four to five million young people who are joining, al allowing for that low employment rate. And we have to employ the unemployed who are looking for work. And thirdly, the third group of, of people who are looking for work and need to be employed are those who want to leave agriculture. We need to pull workers out of agriculture. What has happened, mm. thanks to uh, the way COVID was handled, that millions of migrant workers went back to agriculture and a process which had begun in 2004 right. 5 where the absolute number of workers in agriculture was falling because construction jobs were growing. You found that 37, 32 million new additional people were added to agriculture as a result of which wage rates have been falling. All of this is not found in the analysis of the economic survey. That's the tragedy. That's what's unfortunate. Okay. And, this, okay. and they are not recognizing that okay. per capita Those consumption... Those are some important points you've raised, Professor Mehrotra. Okay, so jobs clearly is a big concern. I think three of you at least agree on that. Uh, and something really needs to be done about it immediately. Uh, Mr. Ajay Bagga, what is your takeaway from the eco survey today? Because markets were like celebrating something. 800 points up. That was uh, Sensex while closing. So markets were not uh, celebrating uh, the economic survey. We opened up uh, as such. Uh, so uh, the economic survey is largely not correlated uh, either with the markets or with the budget. Uh, when there were two volumes, uh, as in the last four years, volume one was uh, clearly aspirational. Volume two was a report card. It was the data reporting. Uh, so it's uh, studied well by the economists. Uh, but uh, the budget process is very uh, different uh, from the economic survey. There's a very low correlation. Second, uh, the last four years, uh, the economic survey, Hina, has been totally off the mark in terms of predictability of the economy. Last year, uh, the GDP growth for uh, this year, which is ending March, was uh, forecasted as 11%. To be fair to them, Nobody forecasted the second wave. Uh, so uh, 
uh, and we are coming in at 9.2. So take that eight, eight and a half percent number as uh, something uh, which is dependent on a lot of things coming through, like Mr. Das very uh, nicely already said. I will not repeat those. But the main thing is, why did the market go up today? I don't know. It has been falling every day. Today also, the foreigners sold 3,600 crores net. The domestic investors bought 3,600 crores net. So uh, that was not, it wasn't flows. It wasn't uh, economic survey. Maybe it was some amount of a budget rally on hope that some measures will come today, uh, come on uh, Tuesday. Maybe that was uh, the big reason. Uh, but I would not ascribe uh, the credit to the economic survey. Okay, Mr. Gurcharan Das, so it could be budget rally of hope now going by what came in the eco survey today and also elections in five very crucial states, including the state of Uttar Pradesh. Are you hopeful of some big bang announcements today? Because uh, the uh, principal economic advisor also mentioned that, you know, we might be able to meet the target. He indicated that the government may have some fiscal space, some extra legroom this time. You know, uh, you've hit the nail on the head. That's my biggest fear, the nightmare of freebies. You know, to have a reformist budget before five state elections is like getting a pig to sing. You, as Mark Twain said, that you either, it's you, are, you either do a futile, you're in a futile job, or you are annoying the pig. So, I think all we can do is cross our fingers. Because of this UP election, the government backtracked, repealed the most important reforms in agriculture in uh, the last 25 years. So I just hope, I just hope that the, the, uh, despite the assurance of the prime minister yesterday, uh, I, I hope that the election, in fact, you know, it's very important, this is important to mention, that politics trumps economics in a democracy, and in India's case particularly, we ought to really push for simultaneous elections, meaning a fixed date, five, every five years, the central election to parliament, and every two and a half years, the same day, you have the state elections. So we don't have this election around the corner all the time, and the government comes to a halt, and, you know, we just get away from what is the right thing to do. Let me also mention a couple of other points, if I may. The risks, other risks. The other risk yes, is sir. that we have really, last year, I mean, was such an exciting budget because all this privatization that we had talked about. Now, imagine only 5%. I mean, it's, it's lovely that Air India has got privatized, but of the total 175,000 crores that were promised so far, only 5%. Maybe the LIC IPO will come beforehand or M M MMTC is going to be privatized. But it's in any organization, when you have that kind of track record, heads roll. And, and there should be accountability, frankly, because government depended on these revenues from privatization. If we are going to grow eight, eight and a half percent, as very rightly pointed out by Professor Merotra, that we need to keep investing. And we need, so I believe that's one risk, the, the, the track record on privatization. The second worry still is protectionism. No country, became, went from being a poor country to a middle-class country without exports. Now, it's lovely that we are, exports are growing, and I hope, hope they keep growing, but I worry because protectionism, 3,000 items 
we have raised tariffs on. And the PLI scheme also is going to fail okay. unless there's a sunset clause on removing, the lowering the duties on these products. And not only lowering duties, but also this rule of origin. You know, when cell phones depend so much on the, the biggest item of export now, well, one of the biggest, that the components come from China. So why are we shooting ourselves in the foot for not yeah. allowing those components to come in? And finally, the MSME success we've been talking about depends on the reason why some of these exports are growing is because simply because the small guys are getting a chance to export through e-commerce, through the Amazons and Flipkarts of the world. And this government keeps meddling. It's only 5% of retail, but they keep meddling with those rules, creating uncertainty in the in probably for the biggest engine of export growth in the future. Okay. You've uh, raised the issue of protectionism. That is important. And of course, uh, uh, privatization, uh, the track record we all know about. But the way forward is going to be very, very interesting as well. Because eventually, this year, at least Air India happened. I mean, that's now out of the uh, window. And now there are many other that we need to uh, you know, keep our eyes on. on. Dr. Brinda, in terms of this uh, privatization or disinvestment pipeline, what is it that you're going to be looking forward to? in the budget tomorrow and how will you like to respond to the uh, you know performance so far because uh, the last one year was a tough one for the government i completely agree that privatization has not gone through and i also agree with what mr gurcharan das is saying is that there has to be accountability because this has gone on year after year so and this is an important source of uh, revenue that the government was depending on so I think uh, th th this is something which we need to do and we have to really uh, see why it's so difficult to do something which, you know, you have to start preparing right from day one and you can't do it on the last day. Uh, where growth is concerned, uh, I, I, I'm still optimistic about growth, of course, uh, because growth has to come from the, say, the fiscal side and the monetary side, which has happened a lot. I mean, they have given their push, but the bulk of the growth now will have to come from reforms and from productivity. And I think that's where the focus will be. The focus has been where uh, pr uh, protectionism. Now, you know, this. Uh, when we talk about being exporting we, and being part of the global value chain, we have to make sure that we are pro producing pro the you know quality, uh, world class quality products. But that's the only way we can be part of the global value chain. And I think that is important and keeping uh, the, the, you know, the productivity again and the standard of production is important. But this, uh, this growth of 8% uh, plus, 8 9% is not going to happen on its own. There's a lot of hard work involved. Uh, of course, capital spending will need to continue. Government infrastructure spending to crowd in private investment will also be, will, will, will be required. Uh, renewable energy. Right. The focus on renewable energy, along with the you know, the, the electric uh, mobility, that is again will that again will help us to move forward because it will bring down our uh, import bill to that extent. Oil import bill. Startups are important because they are creating jobs and they are creating innovation. And uh, so, I, I, and I think of course the services sector. We need to open up, and you know, unless you open tourism, travel. Uh, hospitality, all this will add to jobs. This, really, In fact, in the eco survey, Dr. Brinda, the uh, government has acknowledged that how services sector was worst hit because of yeah. the pandemic. And uh, we can really hope now something direct also coming for this particular sector. But Mr. Ajay Baga, talking about the issue of disinvestment, privatization, uh, uh, you know, markets really did well in the last one year. And many, uh, in fact, were of the view that probably it's not reflecting what's happening in the economy. Uh, do you expect a more reasonable disinvestment target this year? What is it that markets are looking forward to? We are expecting one and a half lakh crores, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, Container Corp, Shipping Corporation, BPCL, all have got shifted to next year already. The banking uh, will not get touched. Uh, you must remember the political capital has been very severely dented with the pharma agitation. 
And now with uh, uh, two years left for this government, you're not going to see any bold reforms. It's going to be very incrementalist. Uh, we are expecting one and a half lakh crores to balance the budgets. Uh, you know, we are the only country where there is about a two and a half hours of budget speech and you are dying by the end of it that just give me the numbers, give me the balance sheet. That's all I need. I don't need the quotes from whichever state is going for elections, the poet of that uh, sta uh, state, you <laughs> give me quotes and you talk. It's a typical bureaucratic exercise. We have not grown up as a country, which if I was presenting to Mr. Das and he was the CEO and I was his CFO, can I present for more than 10 minutes? He would not give me even three minutes. And we waste so much time of so many people. I will tell you something very, very simply. There is no way we are reaching $5 trillion this way. Second, it's more towards getting re-elected than making uh, big, bold reforms. It's unfortunate in a democratic system. Third, this myth of being able to manufacture our way out is not possible now because what China did in the 70s, 80s, 90s, there was no China at that time. You know, we are celebrating, we reached $40 billion in exports uh, per month. China does $400 billion. China is five times our size, but in exports, it's 10 times our size. With all the infra, with all the money, I used to analyze Chinese companies. When we would send them queries, they would say, I will make the p &L as you want. You just go ahead and uh, do it. There is no rule of law. There is no protection. The biggest guy could be put behind bars. $37 billion IPO, you, uh, you know, remove one week before. Uh, Ant Financial was going, or DD Global goes uh, live in the US, and then uh, moment it is listed, you go ahead and see your app is banned because I have privacy issues. That doesn't happen anywhere else. In a democracy, how will we win that? It's very difficult. We are a hollowed out economy. We must go for unskilled jobs, labor intensive jobs, have public works, that is what we are doing. And the biggest risk, if you ask me, is but we Mr. are Bhatta, getting When old. you said that do let not me, expect bold just, reforms, me does it mean that you are also expecting some populist measures this time? And, you know, in a way, stage has already been set with the uh, uh, the principal economic advisor via the eco-survey trying to suggest that, you know, we'll be able to meet the fiscal deficit target. Our uh, revenues oh. have been quite good. So we have space. So if tomorrow some big populist measures are announced, you know, there'll be an alibi for the government to say we had money. No, you know, that money has been manufactured, Hina, because you have shown that you will have a 17 lakh crores deficit till December. You have done seven and a half lakh crores because you have not spent. Now, if in the next three months you don't spend, you can meet that target. Otherwise, that 5.8 is a myth. That's why I say this economic survey, please don't take it seriously. It is more aspirational by some researchers sitting in one corner. They are not the bureaucrats who are running the country. Now, are you going to spend that 10 lakh crores in the next three months? If you are not going to spend it, then yes, you will meet that fiscal target. Otherwise, you are at 6.2, 6.3, not 5.8. Second, you are not adding the state 3%. Third, your GST compensation runs out. Okay. The states are all pleading that next year I will not be able to meet my target. Otherwise, allow me to borrow 4%. How will I make my uh, uh, balance sheet run at the state level? So these are the issues we should be discussing instead of quoting all kinds of poets and doing two hour, 42 minute budget speeches. What? Where does it take us? Do we address all these issues? How will you, and the last point where you interrupted me, which is the biggest looming issue, if you ask me as a nation, you have to get rich before you get old. Most of the nations got rich before they got old. We have a looming demographic because already this year we reached that uh, demographic plateau. Another three to four years, more Indians will die than uh, will be born every year. And then you are in a Japanification. In another 15 years, you are looking at a Japanification okay. when you are such a poor country. I think the need for reforms, the need for action is now. And you have to take things you can do with this population okay. that you have. We can't make all of them coders. We can't make all of them BPOs. 
the need the for the reforms the is right now. That's something which is very important. Mr. Gurcharan Das, going by, uh, you know, what happened to the uh, much-awaited farm sector reforms, the three farm laws, the way they were eventually taken back, do you think that probably uh, the government will refrain from really making some big, bold reform announcements tomorrow? Well, you know, I, I'm not, I can't gaze into the crystal ball and, and, and frankly, one, one doesn't know. But if they, if they went back on, a, on the agricultural, on the farm law reforms, that was, I mean, that was a tragic moment. And the worry now is that no one's going to touch agricultural reform for a whole generation. And so really, um, one I suggested the idea of fixed term elections as a way out of this. But um, there are, um, I mean, the, 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 the reality uh, is, I mean, a, a lot of the things have already been, 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 been said here. But let's just cross our fingers that they don't go into a freebie mode. I mean, if it would be wonderful if they, for example, the biggest reform the nation needs now is electricity distribution. And it's, it's a crying need. It's a, nothing diminishes our country more than the brownouts and the blackouts. And we have excess power. And, and because of the state electricity boards, and we have a minister now who really believes in it, and he has got a bill, but these farm, this, 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 the, the, the tragic turnaround, and they've, they've taken away those clauses out of the electricity uh, reform bill, which were going to bring accountability. And, and uh, if, I mean, if we can pull off that electricity in the next 12 months, if we <clears throat> really get, um, electricity distribution, either privatized or competition, you just create competition in, in, in that area, okay. uh, you will have a huge impact on the country's uh, competitiveness. Okay. Dr. Brinda, now talking about uh, the budget tomorrow, uh, any one thing if you don't hear, you will be disappointed, given the current okay. circumstances. I am, no, before that, Mr. Gurcharan Das talked about freebies. Uh, now every single person is just falling over each other to say, uh, give away freebies. So should there be something, maybe the, it's the election commission, or you know, should somebody just step in and say that uh, parties can't do this, and if they want to do this, they should do it out of their own funds and not take taxpayers' money. So I think we need to draw a line there, and uh, it, it's all political parties and not just the party which is in power. Uh, and then tomorrow, I am looking. To, I, I I look at this budget as a continuity, and I think the theme would be growth. Because it, remember, even during the pandemic, when the government was giving out uh, the support, it didn't do it in the form of doles and freebies. So everybody was shouting and saying, "Put money in the hands of people." And why are you looking at the supply side? So I think the government even then supported supplies and manufacturing and getting people back to getting the businesses back on their feet. So I think that is a theme I would like to see in the budget tomorrow. Okay, and uh, we have Mr. Swaminathan and uh, Ayer also now joining us on the broadcast, requesting Mr. Ajay Baga and Gurcharan Das and Dr. Brinda to please stay on with us. So thank you for joining us here on Mirror Now and Urban Debate this evening. Uh, uh, you know, your uh, comments on the eco-survey that came out today, is it reflecting how the reality on the ground is? Economic survey? You mean the economic survey? Yes. No, no, the economic survey is a very yes, boring document looking backward, attempting not to give any hint about the budget. Uh, it's sort of recalling what's happening and basically trying to take credit wherever credit is due and trying to keep silent on areas where things have gone wrong. So I would say that, yes, the economic survey does say that an important issue in the coming year 
if it's going to be the course of COVID, it's going to be the course of what happens to Omicron and some new variants. And to that extent, that we must be flexible and agile and adjust our policies accordingly. I mean, that's the way they put it. For the same reason, the GDP forecast, instead of giving one figure, they said between eight and eight and a half percent, because there's some uncertainty on what's going to happen on the health front. But they do stress that you know health is important, but mostly they are taking credit, credit for whatever they have done in the past. Uh, they are putting forward the thesis that we did a fantastic job in vaccinating so many people. They don't so very much about all the bungling earlier on, how slow we were off the mark, how many more people we could have done than we could have done now. But anyway, at this particular point of time, uh, the, we seem to be over the hump on Omicron. The global trend everywhere is that this rises sharply for about four weeks and then falls off very sharply the next two weeks. So India is getting to the four weeks peak level and in the next two weeks it might fall off very sharply. If we follow the global trend, then that fall off is going to take care of the worst parts of the problems. However, the absolute numbers, the numbers affected will be large, the numbers who require hospitalization will be large. And above all, we cannot rule out the possibility of yet another highly infectious variant coming up in the next five, six months. After all, when Delta came and Delta went, we thought, okay, now we can relax. And within six months, we were hit by one more wave. So we don't know how many more waves are going to be there. So we have to be on the, on the look for another future wave says that therefore the coming year has to be a year in which we have to worry about right. okay uh You've also, sir, called it an election budget, Mr. Iyer. Now, uh, you know, the guests here on the panel so far have suggested that the uh, finance minister should really avoid giving freebies, given the fact that there are five uh, states going to polls in the next few days, one of them being uh, the state of Uttar Pradesh. Uh, what is your view uh, and what is it that the government should really avoid doing tomorrow? What should the finance minister avoid doing tomorrow? Because today in the eco-survey, we got a sense that you know the government will have some elbow room to spend more because uh, the principal economic advisor was of the view that we'll be able to meet our target in fact the uh, fiscal deficit number could be much better than what we are expecting i expect this to be an election budget the up election is extremely important uh, almost as important as a general election and i think the attitude will be that you know forget about an economist budget this has to be a political budget so as a political budget, I would expect a very large number of schemes or an expansion of existing schemes so that every possible vote bank is covered. There'll be a farmer, small industrialist, large industrialist, backward region, hilly. I mean, all the different bases will be covered. I expect, I mean, there are already many schemes. I would expect increased allocations for these or maybe a few new schemes. Again, uh, there is a fiscal problem. Uh, there will be some fiscal space if you assume 8% growth. I mean, 8% growth would give you a lot of new uh, revenue. But nevertheless, this government is also very keen on increasing capital expenditure. It's boasted about that, and the economic survey does so too. So I suspect they will do what they've done in past years, that instead of spending large amounts out of the budget, you create schemes that the banking system will finance. And so the bank funds are used that the government may give some small interest subvention uh, or some small contribution, but the bulk of the heavy lifting would be done by the banking sector in expanding these different schemes for all these different kinds. I mean, your Kisan cards, your agricultural loans, your small industry loans, self-employment loans, backward industry loans. I mean, all of this can be tweaked as to show that, you know, we are doing more for all these people. I think the emphasis, therefore, is going to be uh, an election budget, there will be no radical measures on major reforms because major reforms create uh, immediate losers before they create long-term winners. So I think you, you will see hmm. the budget, which is, I would call an election budget.
Okay, you're going to call it the election budget, but uh, no radical measures can really, uh, you're not really looking forward to any kind of radical measures. Uh, Mr. Ajay Bagga, one thing, if you do not hear from the finance minister tomorrow, uh, you will be disappointed. No, expectations are very low. Uh, the hands are tied. Uh, as Mr. Swaminathan already said, you know, there's not much of uh, space left and uh, it, uh, the political capital has got eroded, so uh, not much of expectations. If we don't get uh, high enough capex, you know, government has spent five and a half lakh crores for the last two years in uh, capital expenditure in the budget. So if that number doesn't come through, that will be a disappointment. Already most of your money is going in interest payments, in salaries, in pensions. And if even that uh, five and a half lakh crores is not carved out, and put into public works and public infrastructure, that will be a big disappointment, Hina. Okay, Mr. Gurcharan Das, one thing that you will definitely want the finance minister to say tomorrow? Well, I, you know, I, I hope Swami is wrong, but he, he is, the, the, the way India reforms is reformed by stealth. And so we may not have any big budget announcement, but if we can just do what the finance minister promised in her last budget, just by stealth, keep that in thrust on infrastructure spending. I mean, talk about accountability, that the monetization pipeline, I mean, that's again, like privatization. That it is. It hasn't taken. I mean, you know, there's such potential there uh, for um, for it, and that's worth a lot of reform. All that sort of uh, thing. So my hope would be that we continue our great hallowed tradition since 1991 of reforming by stealth, so that India grows at night when the government sleeps. <laughs> uh, Mr. Ayer, I want to give you now the last word. Of course, uh, you know, like every budget, even this year, we feel the budget is going to solve all our problems. There are many problems that need to be solved. But one thing that you want the finance minister to definitely tackle tomorrow. Okay, I will say what she definitely will not do, and that is go for radical reform. Uh, what I would like to her to say that, you know, okay. we are wasting our time uh, fiddling around with marginal changes to a program here and there. We are not addressing the issues of major reform. But within that, even if economic reform is not possible, two, three major areas. One is law and order. Why is it that while your own uh, economic survey a couple of years ago said that one of the most important things after Mr. Mr. Modi's re-election should be to have a situation of police reform and the judicial system reform. This is important both for actually delivering justice, which nobody gets, and equally, if you want an economy to be functioning and sanctity of contract uh, and all uh, the liquidations and other things to be done quickly, then you must have a judiciary and a police system that works. We don't have that at all. So I would say that, you know, that is something we really need to put a huge emphasis on. Over and above that, I would like an easing of various other things <laughs> like the sedition law and various laws by which there is a miscarriage of justice instead of actual justice. So I would say justice is a very big area. And within that, there is a considerable amount to be done in conceptualization and funding, equally on education and health. Now, there are people who keep saying, what about spending a little more on education? But we have seen that even after spending on education has gone up in the last 10 years, you find something like Pratham surveys basically saying that there is no improvement in outcomes. And you still have a situation where somebody in class five cannot read a text for class two. And this situation is not improving despite a very substantial improvement in infrastructure, despite having a supposed right to education act. So the question is, how do you get away from these uh, gestures like right to education act to actually reforming education where education becomes a right and not simply some, uh, a piece of paper, which at the end of it all is not implemented by various teachers unions and other unions and which nobody takes seriously. 
I mean, there's a huge rise in inequality. People are complaining about that. I always say, if there is no equality of opportunity, you cannot get equality of outcome. And with your current education and health system, where there is very little for the bottom people, and the top people are getting the best possible education and health, right. obviously inequalities will increase. So you need to start at the grassroots. So please do something about basic education, health, and above all, about police judicial reform. All right. I think uh, those are some interesting suggestions that have come. Uh, and we all now uh, will look forward to what eventually comes out in Budget 2022. I appreciate all of you for joining us here on Urban Debate this evening. Thank you very much.